Dana, and our three excellent speakers. Thank yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the Open Group for hosting us, and thank you all for joining in. Uh, I'm Dana Gardner, a principal analyst at Intro Harvest Solutions, and uh, I'm often in the role of moderating panels and podcasts, and I've been covering IT and infrastructure and the enterprise environment, data center environment for 20 plus years. So I'm uh, delighted to be here with our guests. We're here with Don Roncato, he's the Chief Strategy Architect at the Boeing Company. Uh, he's got 25 years of experience as an enterprise architect. Uh, he's often working these days at Smart City Projects, and I've had the pleasure of working on other uh, discussion projects with Don, so welcome. I'm also here with uh, Florian Mayer, he's the Project Manager at BMW, and he's uh, involved in mobility technologies, uh, on-demand mobility, and represents uh, BMW in the consortium of Biotrope, or Biotrope? Biotrope. Biotrope, thank you. Welcome, everybody with us. And uh, Ron Schultz, who we uh, heard from just recently uh, this afternoon, he's involved with the group's Universal Data Element Framework and is uh, the manager of Data Harmonizing LLC. So, listening to a lot of the discussions over the past uh, day or two, I'm, I've been toying with the idea are we in a golden age of data business value or are we entering it? Um, what's preventing us from attaining uh, the idea that data can allow businesses to better understand their objectives, better monetize, better understand the user experience and execute on it. Uh, it seems to be a lot of the big parts in place. Uh, am I right? Are we in a golden age or are we uh, not realizing our potential? I think we're I think we're not quite there yet, but I think we're on the edges of it. What I mean by that is this notion of, um, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of put it in two categories, this notion of universality of the data. Um, you've heard this morning or this afternoon about you know, how we have to classify and tag data. And there's, uh, there's some friction associated with that. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes a lot of skills. And ultimately, we get to a point where data is intuitively uh, classified um, think or print it or tag, if you will, um, in all kinds of applications and all manner of data acquisition. That's really the first step, is getting that university, universality to happen. The second is motivation. I think that, that we have it as a sort of as a world or as a galaxy of, 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 of carbon-based forms, figured out whether we're chasing value or profit. And I think when those two pieces settle down, then we can head off sort of as a the planet, if you will, to solve these problems. Do we need to uh, execute on the profit first in order to get to the value? Um, that's a good question. I don't know because you know, there's increasingly a rise of nonprofits that are you know, distributing value to the community. Today, in sort of my slides and some of the others you've seen, and, sort of, and everyone's like, we hear all about these Apache licensed things, or the Linuxes of the world, or the young man that's now updated personally 2.5 million Wikipedia articles two, three hours a day for the last 12 years. That speaks to this notion that that story is growing because individuals as well as organizations are realizing that, that profit is not the motivator, it's getting to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And so we can take advantage of that in terms of returning it to a community of investors <clears throat> or we can just use it to proliferate this, the story itself. So, I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> Ron, do you see us uh, on the uh, cusp of a golden age, and is that cutting across both profit and altruistic value or societal value as well? Well, I, I believe we're close, and I truly believe that we could get there, but I truly believe that there's got to be some, some that ultimately everything comes down to a supply and demand, and the demand side right now is, is probably the data science. Profession. I, I, I was very, you might say, excited about data science getting some significant interest within, you know, major companies and, and the potential that, that data can release really has to be demand driven. And, and so if, if the data scientists could begin to see that that a concept like ODEF, as an example, could be an enabler for them to get there quicker, then I think, but, but it needs the exposure of the data science folks 
before that would happen. It's interesting you bring that up. So I have a 19-year-old son, and I've been encouraging him to become a data scientist. Um, and he says, no, Dad, I want to be in a creative endeavor. And I said, you have no idea. This is about the most creative thing you can be doing to have the most impact on the world. Uh, but he still doesn't quite get that. What, what's the catalyst? What's the hump that we need to get over that sort of compels the idea that uh, the data-driven analytics, data science types of pursuits are, in fact, a, a foundational aspect to, uh, to so much of, of what we define as Have one of us tell them that instead of you, Dan. <laughs> I mean, like that. Well, I believe it's important to, to understand the, the, the motivation. Uh, I think the, the data being available and being broadly available at this point in time is just so much greater than it has been before. It's so much easier to access the data, and especially if it's understandable data due to several reasons. Um, then I, th I think data science is really important. Yes, it's really interesting. Too. So in the business world, uh, corporations, whether they're motivated by just profit or uh, maintaining the quality of life for, for all of their employees or all of the above, uh, it seems to me that they get the idea that the better they are at data and analytics, the better and more successful they're going to be as, as a company. And in the smart cities environment, uh, most governments, uh, local, state, federal, around the world also recognize that it's, it's getting to the point where it seems to be, I don't know, ingrained in the organization culturally, uh, data-driven rather than scientifically data-driven. Um, any thoughts about where the cultural shift needs to happen? Education, incentives, behavioral patterns. What, what do we sort of need to see happen in order for this to become a cultural phenomenon rather than a technical one? Hmm. Well, then you bring us to our cities. The deal is, is that people are flocking to cities worldwide. They're not flocking to move to the country. They're all moving to the cities. And so cities, especially European ones, have jumped into this notion of smart city as a way to make their cities more attractive, to make more attractive, to make them more economically viable, to make them more efficient with the spaces they have, to make their air cleaner, to make their trees and grass greener, and so on. The deal with companies is that, that, that while companies seek to be more profitable, they may not be seeking to get more employees, or they may not be seeking to make the air cleaner, they may not be seeking to make the grounds greener and get more people to the cities. And so they're not quite yet aligned. Although, I mean, I, I like this this uh, this fact that you're describing about, that Ron has mentioned about supply and demand of data practitioners. By making data more universally understandable, palatable, interesting on your son's behalf, um, more creative, uh, to, to make that, once that's happening, and, you know, you see the open group sort of opening the door to having a standard sort of certification around it. Now you open the door to universality, to making things understandable to everyone. It's no longer mysterious data. It's now practical, usable, viable, visual data. One of the comments that one of the folks made on the stage by IBM was making data visual. I mean, I purposely put GraphML on the board up earlier because that's the first step is to make data visual. As we make it more creative, and I'm saying that again for your son, creative and visual, uh, we make it more powerful, therefore it's more universal, therefore we get more attraction to smart cities and ultimately to companies and to, and to any sort of th thematic activity that's happening in society. Make the value attractive, show the metrics, show why doing this is better, using objective measures, that you get people doing it. Mm -hmm. As we were talking at a large scale level governments and enterprises, uh, what if we drill down to the household? Um, I like to think uh, I have a data driven household. I make decisions on what I purchase in the supermarket in a, in a data driven way now that I would never have done five years ago. I can actually analyze what I buy and what makes sense to buy in bulk and in advance, and should I use this service or that service? So. As a consumer, I find myself more data-driven. Uh, when it comes to the environment, my house keeping it warm, but not too warm, but not too cool in the summer either. I'm more data-driven. I'm taking information in from any sensor I can get, and I'm using you know, cloud services as best I can, and I'm trying to be efficient. And yes, I can save the planet, and I can save a few bucks at the same time. So maybe people are more data-driven than they realize these days, and maybe that's the connection that we need to pursue, is how to 
to make people understand the, the micro data driven world that they're finding themselves in and then applying that to a larger scale. Uh, any thoughts about the connection between a, a home as an enterprise and business and culture and society? I think uh, the, it's just a perfect example you mentioned. Uh, it's in my opinion mostly about uh, creating a win-win situation, being it for the customer, being it for a company or even being <coughs> it for, uh, for a smart city. And I think the uh, data approach is just one way you can find that uh, and even prove that win-win situation very easily. Yeah, as soon as you get it viable for the end consumer being somebody living in their home saying, I want this, guess what? It'll happen real quick. It'll happen real quick. Now, how do you make that happen is, you know, but the end consumer at, you know, within the home, they have to get visibility to what is possible. If they have visibility to what is possible, and, and there's enough pilots that have happened to, to get uh, media coverage, it will happen. Well, uh, Dave, you're such a poet. I mean, what do you have with these individual, you know, household thing? I mean, those set up folk ways, if you will, ways we do it in the Dana household, and it goes on to your children and family and spouse, and all the way to your neighbors, they hear about it. Now we get neighborhood mores, how we typically do it in this community or neighborhood. And if it's successful, because you're an international guy, and you have an international presence on the web, tens of thousands of people here, and then it becomes sort of a, it's a consensus thing. That's, that's the data way, it's the right way. I've seen it, I've used it, I like the story. <coughs> then you get cultural consensus. Once you have cultural consensus, then you have demand and bias for that particular perspective. And this is why we're here, this is what the Open Group is. We get consensus to these ways of doing things, and we apply a tax or tax only with it, a way of doing a you know, functional architecture. And then people take home that pattern of essentially a conceptual idea with a functional <coughs> architecture of name products and vocabularies, and they go home and they do it. And then we're all trying to figure out how to tune it. Right, well, so if, if we're uh, sort of gnashing our teeth over why these things happen slowly, uh, I would offer you that things are happening so rapidly now. Uh, this whole idea of the little battery-powered scooter in, in many cities, uh, that's taken off in a matter of months. Uh, the whole idea of uh, Uber and, and Lyft uh, a, a year or two ago uh, happened virtually overnight. The idea of going to the airport and using your phone rather than a piece of paper to uh, code yourself and check in. Uh, so things can happen really fast if people see a, an advantage to it. And so we talk about things, maybe it's a semantic issue. We talk about data-driven, as I said data-driven household, but really it's about its convenience and automation and efficiency, uh, being stingy, saving a few dollars, saving a few minutes. So the idea of being data-driven is it's, it's to me more of a, um, a lifestyle issue. Uh, as a business, you're more profitable, you're more efficient, more productive, but as an individual, I have a better lifestyle. I have control over my life. I have a sense of what my spending or return on uh, spending would be or wouldn't be. So maybe we're going to talk about this more in terms of the human payback of time, convenience, optimization of time and efficiency. Right. Wow. So, I mean, you, you mentioned sort of the, the full court of almost, I'll call the American experience. Maybe the American experience is becoming universal, but I think you just codified the notion of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, education, and health care, and an internet connection. And so all those are rolling for you, Skipper. And, and so that, I mean, that's a pattern. It's a good pattern. And the notion is, can we pattern the rest of the world to that experience? I mean, I think, you know, the American experience, you know, somehow, the really honest experience, invented something called Social Security and Retirement. It never existed in the world before that. And, now, you know, in places like Norway, thank you, and, and, and Switzerland, we're talking about things like $25,000 or $35,000 USD income a year just because you happen to be a citizen on planet Earth in this country. And so those are all about this evolving the pattern that you've described of being in your household. And 
and making it more sort of university. So I'm going to go back to the story that the beauty of our standards are that it allows you to do TOGAF or ODAF or, or OP3 anywhere in the world, or in the galaxy, I should say, in the same way. And if you decide to do it differently, then there's a variance between what we do and we can measure that to, to figure out what the best way for it is. So all this comes together in sort of a really cool story. So back to your golden age. Maybe we've always been in the golden age, but I, I think that we're on the edges of even bigger things. And that might just be with my technical optimism uh, there, Mr. Flores. My technical optimism tells me that as we get smarter and we get metrics on our behaviors and patterns, we can improve them and make them better. Mm -hmm. All right, so we were in the middle talking about cities and governments and enterprises, and we went micro to lifestyle and households. Let's go even further up, 100,000 feet, to the general economy. Uh, just recently, we've been hearing that, gee, we had a terrible recession in the beginning of 2008 and crawled our way out in 2012, and we've been uh, petering up, uh, but not this grand boom, even with low unemployment even with low interest rates, the new normal, uh, the economists are now coming to conclude, is going to be continued low interest rates, continued low inflation, continued low unemployment, but not a boom, not uh, a surge in uh, life, uh, um, uh, quality of life. Um, earnings are flat. The many statistics about what actually makes you, as a business or an individual, more successful are flat. So it seems to me that there's another opportunity to uh, translate what a data-driven organization is to the productivity bottom line, that if we're in a stagnant, essentially, global economy, what else do we have but more data, more efficiency to eke out a uh, higher quality of life? Is there a bigger economic story here that we're not bringing to the, uh, to the fore? Well, I guess the first question I sort of ask back in general, why is it that we think that things have to be better economically instead of just more value to a thing? You know, I keep thinking of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. The idea is that this kid had a 10 cent bar of chocolate that he'd last, make it last for a month. And one could argue that despite the, the lifestyle of the, the Charlie family, uh, that it was quite poor, but there might have been more happiness there than someone who lives in a 15,000 foot mansion in Scottsdale, Arizona. So I'm not sure if that's a, it's any more a, a factor for the happiness and success, or success of the society. So I'll, I'll sort of ask back, are the ways of our past the mechanisms for our ways going forward? It's certainly not been the way of technology. We've <coughs> gone from sort of top-down requirement stacks of three to 500 pages and 50 million lines of code to now nobody wants that old NASA code. They want to just do a SpaceX and get five people together and write 10,000 lines of code in a model and go build a rocket ship. It's cheaper and it doesn't take as long. And so often the ways of our past aren't necessarily the ingredients of our future. So maybe that, that our drive to success is not particularly shown in the notion of a, of a, of a gross national product. And maybe those numbers objectively weren't as accurate as we think they were because today we have better mm -hmm. models. Um, but certainly our news factor is different, but I'm not so much buying that we're not doing better this year than we were in previous years. And I'll, again, it's the hat of uh, technology and optimism, but I don't know, Ron, what do you think? Well, um, I believe that one of the inhibitors, which is sort of what you're alluding to, is that many businesses are still process-centric. Mm -hmm. they, they want to change or improve their processes, and, and data, data is a, you know, a secondary thought. In other words, being data-driven means you look at the value stream of the data going through your enterprise and, and adjust the processes to best accommodate how you can move that data through the enterprise, which I call the lifeblood of, of the enterprise, how you can move that data more effectively to make better decisions. But most, most schools still probably teach for computer science 
uh, what are your processes, your process centric and process driven. We need to change our schools to think data driven and what are the value streams of the information flowing through the enterprise and then adjust the process. I think that's a fundamental barrier to getting to the economic adjustments that the enterprise, if you want to be agile, you better have your data moving through fluidly. Yes. And if you're process centric, it's not going to happen. So I accept that we should perhaps check the premise that a high growth is synonymous with success. But uh, Wall Street still judges companies that if you're not growing, then you're failing. Uh, oh. Apple, Apple Computer uh, is now uh, making $84 billion a quarter of revenue, but because they're not growing at 20% a quarter, uh, their stock is flat and their the price earnings ratio is 12, which is below average. Um, it just seems that the capitalist system rates growth uh, above stagnation, and, and, and the fact is that a large portion of the populace feels stagnant, that they're not growing in their real terms, and that therefore there's this great inequality and we're starting to see political and social uh, ramifications from that. So I'm just wondering if mm, being more data driven, more, more empirical uh, as a citizen and uh, as a society might allow for people to share more of the pie by being more efficient with their time. Because the end goal might be profitability, it might be sustainability, it might be simplification, but the data driven process is what allows those end results to happen much more likely than the blind or the all or nothing. You can buy a new car or lease a new car or it's a piece of junk, but there's arbitrage in the middle. I might want a good car for the two months in the summer when I drive the most. And I won't want a good car in the winter when I don't drive the most, so can I do that? Well, you might be able to. That would be more sustainable, it would be more efficient, there would be less drag in the economy. But you could never do that without a digital data-driven view and management and optimization. So, so I'm more interested in the optimization, even if your end goal is sustainability, profitability, growth at all costs, or simply making uh, a better uh, household for your, for your kid. Well, I mean, I, mean I, I love that story that you're painting. And so, you know, I would question, you know, our society is, is gauged gross national product based on certain metrics. Um, but it didn't take into account how many, how many miners lost their lives in, in, in mines or how many people died of some blood-borne illness because of some chemical that they were breathing in. But we now have the ability to take in complex metrology that we never ever could before. Because essentially we limit ourselves to linear equations of n number of variables. And now we have the ability to take on gigantic eigenmatrices of thousands and thousands of variables and compute them all at the same time within milliseconds. I put Kafka up there for a reason. I mean, Kafka is all about processing data streams within you know, 100 milliseconds or less. And so you know, we're now maybe, maybe our society is actually growing in different kinds of areas. Maybe there's more kids that, that, are, that, are, that live to be five or 10 years of age, or there's less legs broken or fingers lost, or people living longer who are healthier and contributing to society, or maybe people can volunteer more hours non-paid to contribute to certain values of, of their neighbors and community. Maybe the sense of metrics, maybe this is what value is, is, is this growing industry of value and maybe a declining interest of profit. So can you, um, can you graph the success of the society if you don't take in all the metrics? I mean, what's it like to run a 1.78 billion person society like China? We don't know, we never had one. What's it like to run a 7.5 billion person Earth when 14% of them live on less than $2 a day. Well, maybe we need to measure that. Maybe instead of measuring <coughs> Apple iPhones, we find out what people are doing with Apple iPhones or Androids, and what they're doing to make society better with the metrics that we can now gather. And we may find that the velocity that we're moving is better than we think, and it's in a different direction, but ultimately, is the value of society the value of the few that invest, or is it the 14% that live on $2 a day. So, so perhaps a common thread here is um, we've heard the intelligent enterprise uh, being bandied about by some big vendors as uh, a marketing term. 
but it seems that it's, it's the driving of intelligence into more aspects of life, business, society, uh, government, uh, intelligence, and that it, there's a fairly broad democratization of that intelligence if you choose to pursue it, that the tools are available to you. Um, what is it about intelligence that, regardless of the outcome that you're seeking, uh, we can bring about in, in, in greater volume? More intelligence to more aspects of more people's lives, more business, small to medium-sized business, enterprise, uh, branch offices in different countries. Instead of the intelligent enterprise, how about the intelligent plan? I've right? heard that from other companies, right? Smarter plan. Um, but, but it's still abstract. Uh, I'm trying to be more intelligent about how I shop, or keep my house, or use my cars. Um, can we actually take the step from being data-driven in the tools and standards we're discussing and convince people that they can be more intelligent, regardless of how they want to execute that, whether it's sustainability or profitability or something or that stuff? What, what, what is it? That we, is intelligence what we're getting at? Better decisions. Right? Better decisions. Ultimately, we're, we, we, everybody makes decisions pra practically every day, I'm sure. So how can you make better decisions based on having access to the data that you need to do a better job? So I think everybody has that. You I, mean, I think that's exactly the point. I don't know if you can ask people to be more intelligent, at least you can enable them to make better decisions. More intelligent based decisions. So instead of the high, highest paid person's opinion dictating what happens in the boardroom, or the oldest, most powerful person in the household, his dad, his mom, his gender unspecific, <coughs> why not have true data driven decisions at every level of every place in society? Is that where we're heading? Well, I like it. I mean, survival of the fittest for smart humans is dumb. I mean, it makes sense for animals, but it makes sense for humans. It just means that you're craftier or evil than your brother. So why can't we just have intelligence for everyone instead of intelligence for the few that can afford it or happen to be lucky enough to fall into the companies that can give it to them or being born of the right of, 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 of the parents or the neighborhood that gave, them, gave that to them? Why can't we just, as I think you're alluding to, why can't intelligence be for everyone? You know, why can't we figure out how to move Earth ahead rather than some select individuals? I mean, this notion of selected survivors or survivorship or successive, uh, only the few get to own and have speaks to a notion of society that doesn't seem quite fair to me. So, so the timing is good, right? We've had these um, occurrences in society, at least in the United States, but I think in, in Europe as well, where uh, being uh, might is right that is not uh, so popular anymore. That uh, is me too, or uh, political correctness. Um, the idea that you could impose your will on somebody else simply because you can, rather than proving it as a data-driven, empirical, formula-made, uh, rational decision, seems to be always a failure. So maybe a, this is a good time in our culture, in our society, to say, uh, we're going to give you the tools. We have the tools. We're standardizing more data, more information, so that uh, decisions will be made not based on fiat or, or power or political uh, leverage, exploitation, but uh, pure rational decision making. It's, it's the Spock versus um, Kirk approach to decision making, is it not? Well, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. The prime directive, too, will throw that in. Well, it certainly <laughs> makes sense. I mean, why is it that, that, that because you genetically didn't get a full kit, if you will, when you were born, that you should be at some disadvantage and, and so on? And why should your family um, and community suffer for that deficiency? When we, we, sh we have a community of people that can help through all those sorts of things, one from prenatal care, um, which is, you know, in the U.S. is some of the worst in the world. But this notion is that, that we should use technology and value in this data science and the metrics that we get to help all of us, not just a few benefit to be more profitable. Data-driven decision-making is a great equalizer. <laughs> it's phenomenal. So if you take that fulcrum that Ron described earlier with this notion of supply and demand on one end and the notion of the 
data scientists that, that maybe there's a new valuation that you're describing that says that, that once that happens, the, the demand for the quality of, of metrics to be able to improve everything, all walks of life, all people, should just sort of happen. The question becomes is that how can that, is what does it take to move away from a society where you buy data to one where you just sort of gift it to survive? Yes, I mean, the whole thing about the BMW, I asked the question about, do you share data with other brands of cars? And I tell that for a reason, and I know I'm being taped and you know my name, but there are car companies that threw me out of their office in the last couple of years because I say, why is it that your brand won't share with a Volkswagen or some other brand? Well, you should have bought our brand. Well, that doesn't seem quite fair to me. I mean, what seems fair is that you find a pothole or a kid on a bicycle in the dark alongside the highway, that something to be done about it not run with a pothole, not shared, nor hit the kid. So on one side, we have open, accessible, data-driven decision-making as the equalizer. But on the other side, porting data, porting analysis that puts you in an advantage in any level, whether it's household, neighborhood, city, government, enterprise, is also an interesting concept. Those who control and even afford and exploit the data to the detriment of everyone else. How do we uh, project the data scientist as equalizer rather than bully? We gotta kill Skynet before we get started. That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> no, lots of companies, the most senior executives hold the data close to their best. only share that which with, which they need to share in order to get their will accomplished. How do we put a value on data sharing and data access and openness that prevents undue hoarding, but also makes it covered, protected, and, uh, and cherished? If, you can, if, if the data loses value altogether, that's not necessarily the right way to go. But if it's too highly valued where people will hoard it and uh, uh, put walls around it, that's not good either. How do we make a, a balanced approach to recognizing a value to data and access to data that, that supports some of these uh, goals? Isn't that the question about the win-win situation again? Because if you find that, that is, in my opinion, uh, part of the solution. If it uh, is it advantageous to more people, then that would be a critical mass to prevent hoarding or blowing up. Or... I mean, uh, I mean, you know, it, it strikes me that the that when we vote, at least in the U.S., is this notion of majority of 51 percent. And you know, one of the things I've had a good time with with an open group or working in Europe is the notion of consensus that everyone agrees or we don't do the thing. And how does one move from where the 51%, you know, the 49 could go and convince or push in the corner and work them over to get them to sort of roll their votes and to become the 51% as compared to we either all agree or we just don't do this thing model. Is that a better model? It, it strikes me that in the US, the, the Constitution got to this point where there's a 70% someplace, I can't remember what it is in our story, but that four-fifths of is this notion that, that we've realized there are situations where we need to be more consensus oriented. But you know, the, this notion of being able to um, uh, share fairly, to give fair vote and fair sort of review of things is something that I, I think we need to figure out. Mm -hmm. Because we can't just allow it to the value of, of something the highest bidder gets to bid for data. Mm -hmm. We have to do it in a way that, that um, that speaks to everyone's <coughs> citizenship and the universality of this data. So to start to close this off, we, we started talking about the business value from data, but we ended up talking about power. We ended up talking about where control over data will happen and how that is yet to be really teased out. It's not even been defined. It strikes me uh, as a takeaway from that that the data scientists it's going to be a very powerful and important individual office within companies, cities, households, uh, making that decision about what data do we share, 
in order for a common good, win-win situation, but we for it. Uh, that's a decision that the data scientists are going to have a big role in, I should think. A very powerful position um, can make or break companies, can make or break the societies. So, so here's to the, the data scientist, uh, a position that's not just a professionally certified um, advantageous career track, but really somebody who can have a momentous impact um, on both their company as well as their, their society. Any questions from the audience?